was thinking really hard about dragonflies and one just flew into this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here we are. I am the dragonfly. Um, at least I think I am. Uh, so I'll illustrate the degrees of freedom on the the projector, but I think I'm, I'm a little bit more interesting. Um, I'm definitely pretty slick. Uh, so you have your your flapping degree of freedom, which is uh, this angle. Obviously, dragonflies have two wings, so are two pairs of wings. But in my analysis, I only focused on uh, one pair of wings, one pair of wings, and I didn't account for interactions between those. So you have your flap, your flapping degree of freedom, and your pitching degree of freedom. So, uh, and corresponding to each uh, angular change, you have uh, a different frame. So you can, when you do your analysis, you have the frame attached to uh, attached to the wing, regardless. Then you have what would be attached to the wing if uh, when the pitch is zero, so here uh, the, the wing frame and what I call the flapping frame are coincident, but now the flapping frame has advanced by an angle, uh, what I measured in my analysis, negative theta, theta, and the flapping frame remains here. You have uh, the, the leading edge frame, which, in which, the, which is the coordinate system when the flapping angle and the and the pitch angle are zero. So here, the flapping frame and the leading edge frame uh, correspond. Now they don't. Now they do. And uh, the body frame refers to uh, the body frame accounts for the stroke plane angle. So I can do I can use normal hovering like this, but I can also use sorry about that. I can also <laughs> use I can also flap on an inclined plane, which dragonflies actually do. Our Utah's uh, micro aerial vehicle did not actually, uh, uh, sorry, we, we did use um, a, a non-zero stroke plane angle, although uh, its effects were actually uh, detrimental to our lift, and I'll explain that shortly. So aerodynamic forces are surface forces. It's not like gravity, uh, which in which uh, the Earth is, the Earth can pull you, Earth pulls you even when it's not touching you. It, um, you're not, you don't witness aerodynamic force unless you're actually coming in contact with the air. So either you come in contact, talk, contact with it um, through shear, um, either through shear or pressure forces. So the blue arrows are uh, pressure forces and the uh, red arrows are shear forces. Um, in, in my analysis, I generally assumed uh, 2D cross sections uh, because that was the only way to make uh, the analysis tractable and somewhat follow the usual theory applied to uh, commercial aircraft. So, when, when we study commercial aircraft, we're able to separate our viscous analysis, our shear analysis, and our our, our viscous shear analysis, analysis and our pressure analysis because uh, it, it's been shown that all the viscous effects are nested in this small layer called the boundary layer. So the boundary layer, uh, so outside the boundary layer, it's almost as if uh, viscosity and thus viscous shear can be neglected. And I'll show you a picture of something obviously in a different regime than dragonflies. It's uh, a supersonic uh, shell with a shock wave, but you can see a slight white tinge around the, the shell, and that's the boundary layer. So it's very small. Um, the boundary layer for, uh, say, 747 is on the order of, say, uh, half, half a centimeter. If you're in the water lab, please correct me. Um, but it, the, the boundary layer is actually uh, comparable in size for dragonflies, and the reason is because dragonflies' wings are moving slower. And so, uh, so, so naturally the free stream will not uh, be able to carry as much of the, as much of the, um, the air near the wing. Uh, okay. 
So, um, so if, you, if we separate the pressure forces and the shear forces, we get the unsteady, we can use the unsteady Bernoulli equation, at least uh, when we assume a rotational flow. And this is, I think most people have heard of the Bernoulli equation in their physics classes from high school. Um, for uh, flap and flight, obviously, we're unsteady. And so we have to account for uh, what's called the apparent mass effect. So the apparent mass effect means that if I'm sudden, if I'm accelerating my wings uh, through the air, I'm also accelerating surrounding air, and I have to, I have to carry, I have to carry that uh, that mass of air that's being accelerated, um, and that turns out to be an appreciable effect. Um, so. When we when we usually analyze commercial aircraft, um, we're usually we're looking at small, relatively small angles of flight, uh, usually uh, 12 degrees or less, and you you get this type of pattern. Obviously, this is shown for a very uh, thin or flat plate uh, wing, but you get a uh, flow that travels around the leading edge. Sorry. So the leading edge is, is here. Um, Mathematically infinitely fast. Obviously, your flat plate is not actually infinitesimally thin, and so you don't have uh, you don't have infinitely fast flow. But uh, you do have uh, you do have uh, very fast uh, flow going around uh, that corner in order to uh, in order to satisfy uh, what's called not very easy being a dragonfly. <laughs> <laughs> In order to satisfy uh, flow leaving the trailing edge, uh, where you can see that second stagnation point, uh, tangentially. Uh, I, I just wanted to show what, a what I mean by a vortex filament. We've all heard of vortices. We've all, most of us are fortunate to have gone canoeing, uh, living in southern Ontario. Um, so we all understand a vortex is something that's swirling. Um, mathematically, a vortex is less easily uh, rigorously defined, but we do, in aerodynamics, uh, talk about vortices uh, and model model them. In my in my work, uh, we model vortices uh, with a one over r um, velocity relationship, and since, since my uh, analysis is predominantly 2D, I, I, tr I, I treat the vortex filament as pretty much uniform along the span-wise uh, or y direction. Um, and uh, in, order, in order to calculate uh, the flow around the wing, uh, I, in, in thin, what's called thin airfoil theory, like, these are pretty thin. Um, we use uh, what's called the vortex lattice method. So we stick a bunch of vortices all along the surface of the wing, and these these vortices um, cancel out or account for the flow that would go in the normal direction through the wing if the wing wasn't there. And the consequence of having those is that you get a difference in the tangential velocities on the different sides of the wing, and you get a pressure difference, and that's how you get lift. Um, I just wanted to show, um, this is an illustration of each of those vortex sheet elements inducing a velocity somewhere else. Now, it's not the same induction that we think of when we're, say, studying electromagnetism, because it's, it's a model, it's a way in which we talk about vortices. The truth is that Vortices describe a flow that would that would naturally be occurring in that scenario. It's not that the, vor the vortex sheet, a vortex over here, makes velocity happen, say where the fire extinguisher is. It's that given that there is a vortex here, what it likely means is that 
at, at least according to our uh, invisible theory, that there would be flow, a small amount of flow happening over um, further, further away. Now, when we calculate the when we calculate that normal velocity that in turn uh, creates that vortex sheet, we have two contributors for our dragonfly. We have translation, so you have a constant normal velocity. Uh, obviously, depends on the flapping rate and the and the angle of attack, uh, but also normal velocity due to rotation or pitching of the wing. So the velocity is linear in the, the chord-wise distance of the wing and leads, uh, and that leads to different uh, account mathematically. Now, we can't exactly apply all of this theory to dragonflies because as we know, especially for thin airfoils, and this is even more so at uh, lower speeds, we have stall. So at about seven degrees, or sorry, uh, you, you get you start to form a little bubble on the leading edge, and shortly afterwards, you get the flow detaches. The flow cannot continue to stay uh, stay along the entire surface of the wing, despite despite visco viscosity uh, trying to force it to do so. But yet, dragonflies we know fly at very high angles of attack. If I'm flapping like like this, I'm at 90 degrees or almost 90 degrees. So how how are dragonflies able to get any lift if we're always stalled? Um, so the main contributor to this is the leading, what's called the leading edge vortex. So I'm flashing back to the this slide on on the flow geometry at low angles of attack. So we have flow going very, very fast around that leading edge. And there, there are ways in which you can cause that leading edge suction, if you will, to end up on the top. I'm just going to show you what it kind of looks like if a vortex stabilizes along your wing. So bear with me. I'll try it. So work that home. So you have this spiraling, um, you have this spiraling flow that goes along the leading edge of the wing, and it stays stabilized there. So, sorry. So why? So why does it, so this flow? Um, so we have, there are many hypotheses as to why this flow stays stabilized along the leading edge. Um, what, one of the hypotheses is that uh, insects have uh, very high pitching rates at the end of their cycles. Um, another, another hypothesis is that uh, they stall. They stall dy dynamically, so when they're uh, they're increasing their angle of attack, they're um, they're also pitching up very fast, and so the flow doesn't have a chance to uh, detach from the wing. Uh, see, the explanation that seems to make the most sense is that the the leading edge vortex is stabilized by the fact that. You're not really trans. You are translating in a sense if you look at it from a 3D perspective. But the wing is actually rotating, and the effect of uh, the 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 non-inertial forces in the in the right in the wing's reference frame have been shown to uh, have been shown to uh, account for the path of the leading edge vortex. You can see in this diagram that the vortex actually starts to peel off and join with the, the what's called the tip vortex near the end of the wing, and that's because uh, the, the curvature of the wing's trajectory leads to curvature of the vortex trajectory. And here is 
experimental version of that. Uh, however, in our analysis, we treat the leading edge vortex in a two-dimensional fashion. So it's always at what is effectively the leading edge. So say I'm first, for whatever reason, moving my wing uh, without my leading edge spar being the most forward uh, edge of the wing, then, that would, then what is usually the trailing edge will become the leading edge. Um, you may be aware of leading edge vortices on delta wings. Um, the delta wings are also very thin, and while the mechanism for uh, stabilization is different, uh, there's of course no rotation of your comfort when you're flying. There is an account for the leading edge vortex that we use in our analysis. And that's called the Polhamis leading edge suction analogy. So usually you have suction uh, going tangentially at your leading edge. And when your angle of attack is high enough and you have a very thin leading edge, that that vortex, um, that, that flow is tripped over and forms a vortex that stabilizes along the leading edge and you get your your force acting perpendicular to the wing as opposed to tangentially. Um, now, the, the, the usual attached flow on the wing uh, will, not, will no longer be there if the flow geometry at the leading edge has changed. So, I read a bunch of very strange papers and seemed to uh, find this thing called discontinuous potential flow to be the best fit of what the flow should look like. So, now this, this diagram illustrates that the air goes to the leading edge and trailing edge and just completely diverges. So that's obviously not the case in, in insects, but it's more accurate to say that there's a finite velocity at the, the two edges of the wing rather than an infinite velocity at the leading edge of the wing in the presence of your leading edge vortex because that, uh, that suction caused by the very high uh, speed flow is already accounted for. And so, I decided to use uh, this method, uh, this flow geometry, to account for uh, the changed flow on the, the windward side of the wing. Uh, unfortunately, that leads to underestimates because the flow on the other side is assumed to be at the free stream pressure, while it's actually a little bit lower. However, I use this methodology to more, mostly to illustrate a way of using flows, using flow geometries from other scenarios and trying to match them with your scenario to get some sort of meaningful result. Um, now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the weight behind the wing. Uh, for those of you who have taken aerodynamics, we, we know that uh, when a wing starts up from from a standstill, uh, there is uh, a vortex that forms behind it. Uh, we have um, that's the reason why our aircraft. Uh, that's one of the reasons why aircrafts need to space each other out in order to avoid flying through uh, each other's way. I'm sure some of you have seen Top Gun, and so I'm going to show you a little bit of a scene from that illustrates uh, a shed board. Um, not a startup vortex, obviously it's not going from a standstill, but the aircraft is accelerating and because of the the, the exhaust you can see, the, the exhaust and the pressure change you can see uh, the, the startup vortex. So when you have your flow changing very quickly, you have uh, you have a very wavy, kind of messy roll-up of vor those vortex elements. So either you can model it, model it as a sheet, or you can model it as discrete vortices. Again, uh, we extend this principle of inducing velocity 
to a 2D, uh, to a 2D plane from, a, from the single axis used in the airfoil theory. Uh, application of the, the, in application of the planar weight, we usually assume that the velocity is constant, but if, if we want to look back on weight roll-up, uh, we, we can see that the velocity direction is certainly changing, and the vortices are going all over the place, and, uh, and their, their velocities are also changing. So I'm going to illustrate the, the difficulties in, or the different ways in which you can estimate velocity in the weight. So say we have a duck. It's not, it's not doing it, putting any effort in it, it's just sitting in the middle of some nice river. And the river velocity is approximately uniform at 5 meters a second. We can generally say that the duck floats around at 5 meters per second in that direction. But now if you want a more accurate estimate, then you have to actually go account for the little ripples caused by the moose drinking water, uh, different uh, breezes. Uh, but it, if you want to find out your general shape, you need to know the lowest order velocity. If you, uh, if you need a higher order velocity, then you obviously have to do a, ha a higher order account. So what happens if you take that duck and just put it in a little pool that has its own splashes? Okay, I'm not sure where the duck went. I think it's over. It went down the water. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> 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 Tim, would you be able to agitate this bucket of water for me, please? Mm -hmm. Um, where can people Turn see the light on? Yeah. Table? The right most okay. at the top, top right. Just give it a little shake, like you mean it. Okay, that's good. That's good. That, no, that's good. So, as you see, the duck floats around, and uh, no one can see. Sorry, you can. Can everybody see the? <laughs> can you see it now? Yes. So, the, <laughs> trying to illustrate that the little wave, you have to account for the little waves and estimate what where the duck would move. Uh, from those smaller disturbances that eventually add up. So that's, a, that's the duck. So in the, the problem in hover is that our average velocity is zero because we're staying in the same spot. And so on the recommendation of a few professors out west, I decided to uh, pretend that the velocity I decided to pretend that the velocity um, of each vortex stays the same after it has left the wave. And that's called a frozen wave because it stays, the velocity stays frozen. It's still wa wavy like those uh, previous diagrams, but those elements do not conflict with each other. I just want to show you an illustration of how this looks. Sorry, I wasn't able to invent this. I'm sorry. <laughs> So that little black thing, that's the weight. Sorry, we did a little bit small. But I wanted to show the weight traveling everywhere. So this is, this is an overestimate of the weight. However, again, my, my, the, my thesis first and foremost seeks to illustrate a methodology of how to solve um, a seemingly untractable problem um, in creative ways. So, in future work, if somebody actually decides to take on this problem again, I would personally recommend uh, studying something called the loud wave. And yes, people who are the helicopter experts in the room will say that the wake 
Now, the helicopter is obviously very different because in a helicopter, I'm not going to do a full turn, but you are you have some sort of symmetry all the time. You're always turning one way with your wings, whereas uh, in the dragonfly case, you go forward and backward, forward and backward. And so, yes, we, we push air downwards, but we have a side-to-side -side motion. However, Lau Lau connected allows you to attenuate the force that you would otherwise uh, get without the weight in a fairly tractable way. And I think that's what we want to do. Because we're, after all, we're just, we're just trying to estimate an, the force analytically. We're not, if we wanted the exact force, we would use CFT. This is for control purposes. And when you're controlling, you're inherently expecting inaccuracies in your dynamics. And your, and your controller will, should be able to account for that. Now, uh, the next thing I'm going to mention is, is tip vortices. Uh, some, most of you are probably already familiar with tip vortices on aircraft wings, uh, commercial aircraft wings, and of course, uh, tip vortices apply in a similar way on flapping wings. Uh, again, I'm going to illustrate the, the, a, smoke, uh, a scenario where the tip vortex and leading edge vortex combine. Um, they, they merge into one another. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, make such a sophisticated account, but I, I did develop my own version of accounting for tip vortices uh, with the theory we usually use for commercial aircraft. So for a semi-infinite vortex, we have, uh, again, a one over, one over R rule, although uh, the velocity induced is obviously half, and um, here we build um, here we illustrate the flow as a bunch of little bunch of little vortices uh, leaving the main attached vortex in order for you to have uh, no, no vortex left behind at the edges of the wing. We have a uh, theory by Helmholtz that says that uh, vortex filaments uh, must must never uh, end except at a, a solid boundary. So at, at the edges of the wing, where you get flow going around the wing instead of um, over the top and forming that vortex sheet we talked about before, um, you're going to have no, uh, you're going to lose that vortex sheet effect and vortices according to the theorem, must go somewhere. So um, they go in they go in the, in the forward-wise direction and cause flow to go uh, downwards. And I do show an equation for the induced downwards, uh, the induced, induced downwash velocity. Um, unlike for con conventional aircrafts that work at uh, low angles of attack, um, usually, for those we we talk about downwash as decrementing our effective angle of attack and calls it creating induced drag. Um, here, the upward direction and the normal direction of the wing are very close together. At very high angles of attack, this is not the case, and I estimated the downwash velocity as going directly normal to the wing and decrementing the normal velocity instead. And that I in turn use uh, in conjunction with in turn use to uh, calculate a lower leading edge vortex effect. Now on to the, vis the viscous effects I'll be very brief. Um, we have our we have our boundary layer again and I estimate uh, I estimated it using uh, the tangential velocity uh, with something called the Blasius boundary layer, which is for flat, flat plates. However, our wings are also unsteady, and here I, I use an analogy. Um, we talked about a parent mass, which is where our wings accelerate the air mass around them when they themselves are accelerating. So I said, as an approximation, as a low order approximation, the air in the boundary layer must also accelerate tangential to the wing. And so that is one way of estimating 
uh, the unsteady effects, uh, unsteady viscous shear effects. And so I claim that uh, vis uh, viscous apparent mass after the apparent mass effect. Uh, this this picture just shows that um, you have when you have a body uh, in in a viscous fluid, you have you also have a region around that body where where the where the fluid uh, is slow is slowed in a where the where the fluid is slowed down significantly, uh, and this adds to the effective. Um, body shape if you're treating the flow as inviscid. Finally, I estimated uh, force for uh, viscous drag, sorry, for viscous drag in rotation by, um, by using something called stagnation point flow. Stagnation point flow is where you have air that goes normal to, uh, normal to a flat surface and it eventually turns and flows tangentially. So when you're rotating a wing, that's sort of what you're what you get. You have flow that's perpendicular to the wing and eventually has to turn and become tangential. And so I estimated uh, so, and I, I calculated that A value to actually be the rate the absolute amount magnitude, the absolute value of the rate of rotation. And so finally we'll um, That, that concludes part two, and part three is very short, I promise. I'm just going to take 